Okay. Okay, well, good day. Um, my name is Neil Oxtoby. I'm a postdoc in the Progression of Neurodegenerative Disease Group, POND, within the Centre for Medical Image Computing, CMIC, at University College London, UCL. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some recent work, which was spotted on BioArchive, why I was invited to give this presentation, and has been published in the current May 2018 issue of Brain. Title is there, as you can see, called Data Driven Models Only Inherit Alzheimer's Disease Progression. Uh, this came out of the PON group, which is uh, co led by myself and Professor Daniel Alexander, who is this other senior lead author. And this is part of some work in collaboration with a larger project that, we, that the two of us run, including the PON group at UCL and seven other institutions in Europe called Europond, the European of Neurological Disease Consortium. So the work today, this brain paper, um, is joint work with Alex Young, another postdoc within our group. We did the, the modeling work within the, the paper, and Daniel, Danny is our boss. So I'll give you a little bit of background and I'll give you some details of the models because it's um, probably unfamiliar to quite a few. And then I'll uh, go through some, some of the results from the paper in some detail. So the background then in general is that uh, Alzheimer's disease is a problem. It's an epidemic, in fact. We have uh, approaching 50 million people uh, with dementia worldwide, which uh, is mostly caused by Alzheimer's disease and is costing the economy and the society quite a lot. In the UK alone, the estimated costs a few years ago was of uh, dementia in terms of care and lost hours for carers uh, amounts to about 1% of the UK's gross domestic product. And uh, recent times in the last couple of decades, fewer than 1% of clinical trials into putative treatments for AD therapies Fewer than 1% of them have produced an FDA approved drug. It's something like one out of 300. And that's not a disease modifying treatment either. That was just a symptomatic treatment. You can find more details in the World Alzheimer Report with cute infographics such as this. So Alzheimer's disease comes in a couple of basic forms. Idiopathic or sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common, making up about 99% of cases. It has a highly variable age of onset, anywhere from before 60 to 80 in your, in your 80s. And an accurate prognosis is quite hard. There's quite a lot of variability in the disease progression. There's a long preclinical pre phase where some biological and pathological changes are going on under the hood while there's no overt symptoms in patients. So it's hard to identify people before the disease has really taken hold and symptoms have kicked in. Uh, the rarer form of Alzheimer's disease is um, the dominantly inherited form, which is a, has a genetic cause, where you have a 50-50 chance of inheriting one of a group of mutations from your parents. This is a fully, pen fully penetrative mutation, um, so mutation carriers will develop symptoms, will develop full-blown dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. But there's some symptom onset is estimatable. The preclinical phase is therefore accessible. And this is, I'll tell you a bit more about this uh, later, but the good point about this is it makes drug trials a little, bit, a little bit easier. We can pick people who are definitely on the disease pathway. So therefore this highlighted point at the bottom of my slide is that dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, uh, with a few caveats, may hold the key to developing disease modifying interventions for more common uh, Alzheimer's disease, the idiopathic forms. So that's why it's important to look at dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. So the data that we have that we looked at in this paper came from the dominantly inherited Alzheimer network, which is based at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. This URL down here, you can uh, read about it and apply for access to the data. It consists of family members uh, of affected mutation carriers. So someone, let's call them a parent, has come into a memory clinic, has been diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease, agreed to genetic testing, um, and most likely has a genetic mutation in one of these three groups, presenilin 1, 2, or amyloid precursor protein. Um, and then their children are approached, who are probably pre-symptomatic, and they are invited to, to join in the study. For this paper, we had data access to data from DataFree 6, which consisted of about 340 participants, and almost two-thirds female, and between one and four visits each 
211 of these participants carried uh, one of the types of mutations. So you can see Prosenlon 1 is the most common. Um, they aged uh, between 19 and 66, an average of 40. And this is a baseline entrance to the study. And these people um, um, oh, right, so yeah, so and they they ranged from 30 years younger than the age at which their parents uh, developed symptoms to 20 years older, uh, which is most of those were the, the actual parents in the study. Um, there's incomplete data, so I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. And you can look at the, the details of these numbers for the included participants in table one of, of the paper. And for more information, if you don't want to read the website, you can also read John Morris's paper from 2012, giving a, an overview of the study. So that's the data. How about the models? I'll give you a brief history of data-driven modeling uh, in the context of neurological diseases, how it sort of uh, hypothetical and traditional statistical models uh, gave rise to data-driven models as data sets grew from being small to large and we could start doing more data-driven approaches. Now this history is a condensed version of a review paper that I wrote with Professor Danny Alexander who's published last year in Current Opinion in Neurology. Now the motivation behind data-driven modeling is to gain a, a holistic picture across the full disease timeline, so a, a sort of disease signature if you will. This uh, gives us the utility to understand the disease better, you know, which can help to identify putative therapeutic targets, so drug, potential drugs. Um, and gives us the ability to stage patients across the full disease timeline, both preclinical, asymptomatic, and the symptomatic phases of the disease, which is useful for prognostic applications in the clinic, for predicting what will happen in the future for patients, and for clinical trials, both for accurate staging, for selection into clinical, clinical trials, and uh, as alternative surrogate multimodal endpoints. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. We used uh, two data-driven models in this paper, something called the event-based model that was developed in our group in 2012, which gives you a sequence of, it represents disease progression as a sequence of events. Um, so it's a fine-grained, discrete staging tool. Um, and we, I'll tell you a bit more in details uh, later. The, the second model we consider was a differential equation model, which uh, attempts to estimate a more continuous picture of disease progression um, by estimating biomarker trajectories from short-term longitudinal data. And this is useful for predicting symptom onset. Um, these, since these models may be quite unfamiliar to many people, uh, and indeed one of my colleagues described uh, this paper when they read the draft as a bit of a tour de force. So to make it more digestible in you know, about 20 minutes, um, I'll describe each model in a bit more detail together with the results. So we'll put the results together with the, the background. So a brief history of data-driven modeling. Um, we first came to disease progression in neurological diseases via some hypothetical models. So this top figure, this largest figure, is from the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative website, the ADNI website. And this, this picture of disease progression being a, a sequence of biomarkers going from normal up to abnormal um, in some sequence of dynamics, uh, going from ranging from pre-symptomatic, cognitively normal, through some mild cognitive impairment prodromal phase into the symptomatic phase of Alzheimer's disease and dementia in general. And this, this was first hypothesized by Clifford Jack and colleagues uh, in 2010. Not just him, there were a few other papers as well, as you can see these references at the bottom of the screen. So it shows the, the understanding that there's a long um, preclinical phase to Alzheimer's disease where there is something going on before symptoms happen. Um, so these are hypothetical models. There were sort of more traditional regression models as well going on before the fully data-driven models came out. Uh, so this is an example from idiopathic Alzheimer's disease, where this paper from 2002 subdivided Alzheimer's disease patients into pre-symptomatic, mild symptomatic, and moderate symptomatic based on their test score in the mini mental state exam, the MMSE. And these are heat maps of neuronal atrophy from T1-weighted MRI, magnetic resonance images. So you can see that disease progresses in a rather sort of crude picture from unaffected, slightly affected to affected 
This is one of the first traditional models uh, for by using regression against a clinical disease stage. Fairly crude understanding of disease progression. Um, when you have an inherited disease, such as dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, you can regress against this estimated disease stage that I mentioned before. So you have an estimate of the years uh, until you will start showing symptoms if you've inherited one of these mutations from your parent, based on the age at which your parents started to show symptoms of dementia. And when you, this is a cross-sectional study from Randy Bateman in the New England Journal of Medicine from 2012. Um, the data points aren't shown, just the fit is, that's for privacy reasons. Um, so we're showing on the left here amyloid deposition in the precuneus, a region in the brain, uh, represented by a, a ratio of uh, uptake for the PET tracer. So that's a, a PET measure of amyloid, and it's quite an early marker where the mutation carriers, the disease, um, preclinical disease patients differ from non-carriers, so healthy controls, quite early, so up to 20 years before estimated symptom onset. And then clinical um, symptoms, mini mental state exam, cognitive impairment starts to show up a little closer to sim full symptom onset, full diagnosis. Um, and regional brain volume, such as the hippocampus on the right here, um, starts to show some differences a couple of years before uh, estimated symptom onset. So this is a more traditional regression when you have some sort of estimated uh, disease timeline, which you don't usually have in most neurodegenerative and neurological diseases. So these traditional models um, have given way once data sets started to become a bit larger into some more new models. And these started with discriminative models, which is essentially machine learning. You can split this up into two types, supervised machine learning and unsupervised. Supervised machine learning learns to classify patients from labeled data. So for example, you can come up with an Alzheimer's disease state fingerprint uh, from this reference in 2011, where a set of biomarkers contribute different weights towards some abnormality score. And these are all fit, this, this model is fit based on known labels of patients and controls. Or you can do something more unsupervised on the right hand side here, which is a more recent paper in PNAS, where they discovered some atrophy factors um, using uh, essentially clustering to find disease subtypes automatically from the data. And you can see that the, they looked at atrophy uh, in subcortical regions deep gray matter usually, temporal region of the, of the brain, and across the cortex. And they found different rates of progression across different clinical stages. From discriminative models uh, to generative models, where you can actually extract what we call a disease progression signature from the data. And these are good for improving disease understanding because instead of just being able to tell the likelihood of being a patient or a control, you can actually understand the disease progression from start to finish. This can basically be split up these trajectory models um, into, so these, this, this particular slide is dealing with continuous trajectory models. On the left here, we have something called self-modeling regression. There's a few examples down here where the, using a, just a couple of assumptions, you can estimate where someone is along a disease timeline by pooling information across biomarkers. These can be regional brain volumes, um, more traditional biomarkers from cerebrospinal fluid, et cetera, et cetera. And on the right, something that uh, sort of came out in 2014, is something called a differential equation model, where you can look at a rate of change on a vertical axis here versus the baseline value and use this so-called differential equation model, this fit to a differential equation, to integrate a full trajectory, which can give you a, an estimate of time um, in a slightly different way sort of complementary way to the self-modeling regression methods. And there's another one that uh, sort of combines generative and discriminative models. And this, this is a little more recent. This is some work that's come out of our lab as well, uh, which jointly estimates uh, disease progressions uh, or stages and the subtypes. So it sort of combines the clustering, the machine learning, the subtypes, and uh, the generative models of disease progression. And this is a paper by Alex Young, the second author on uh, the paper I'm talking about today who is the lead author on this bioarchive paper um, on subtype and stage inference, where instead of just estimating a disease progression sequence for a group of patients that may have uh, different underlying progressions, she manages to do some clustering along with disease progression estimation to find unique progression sequences for subgroups of patients. So that leads me nicely onto uh, the first model from our paper, 
which is the event-based model. Now, the event-based model, I'll tell you a little bit more about it, give you a bit more intuition behind how it works and some of the details, and then we'll jump into the results. So the original paper, is uh, this is the header from the paper here, it's written by uh, Hubert Fontaine and Danny Alexander. Hubert's a former member of our group, and it estimates uh, an order of events, I'll tell you what they are in a second, from cross-sectional data. It doesn't have to be longitudinal data, but you can get a longitudinal picture of disease progression. Also estimates uncertainty in this ordering. So before I go into this slide in detail, I'll just quickly give you a quick idea on how the, the, the model works. Uh, it can learn an ordering and an uncertainty in the ordering of abnormality in biomarkers, a set of biomarkers, directly from the measured data set. Um, and requires, importantly, no predefined staging variable. So no estimate of time to onset, no estimate of disease time, disease stage, or clinical status. So the EBM uses the idea that more individuals from a cohort containing a spectrum of disease stages, more individuals will show abnormality in biomarkers that change early in the progression. So if we look here in this cartoon of two events called event one, event two, biomarker one and biomarker two, um, turns out biomarker two happens first in this cartoon, it becomes abnormal first, and biomarker one becomes abnormal second. So the blue curve here, biomarker one, down here below is measurements from individuals. Each of these vertical stripes is an individual measurement for that biomarker. And the corresponding measurement for biomarker two, event two, the red one is directly below. So you can see towards the left here, early in the disease progression, the blue event, event one, biomarker one, has mostly normal measurements, so yellow on this color bar, quite low event measures. But we have more of those same individuals having abnormal measurements for event two. So we can infer that event two comes first without even knowing that these people are actually early in the disease progression, just from the combination of those two measurements. So this would imply that event two becomes before event one without even knowing this, uh, this progression pitch here. Now this idea of pooling information across biomarkers, the idea that more individuals early in the disease progression will show abnormality in early biomarkers, makes sense, is, is spreading. In particular, the same idea underlies the ATN, the amyloid tau neurodegeneration framework of Clifford Jack and colleagues which was recently updated and published in Alzheimer's and Dementia uh, as the 2018 NIAAA Research Framework toward a Biological Definition of AD. Now, the NIA is the National Institute on Aging, and AA is the Alzheimer's Association. So the sequence that is ordered, that is estimated, even if we don't know where these people are, this still works. So this is the jumbled up version of reality, a combination of biomarker measurements in this cartoon on the left. The picture of disease progression that we get out is down on the bottom right of the slide, this positional variance diagram, where the maximum likelihood order of the biomarkers is from top to bottom, and that gives the disease stage from left to right, with the confidence here given in a grayscale form. So the closer this is to a black diagonal, the more confident we are of the relative, relevant, the relative ordering within the sequence. So later in the sequence, we're quite sure that this last biomarker becomes abnormal last. And we're reasonably sure that these early ones are uh, before these middle ones. So this positional variance diagram gives us an idea of the ordering and a visualization of the ordering and the uncertainty in that ordering. Um, there's a further, so th this is estimated using uh, Monte Carlo um, sampling, MCMC sampling for the model posterior. And if you want more details of the model posterior, um, you can, of the equations, the actual maths underlying the event-based model. I'll point you to a couple of papers. Um, I'll point you to another paper, sorry, in just a second. Um, the model is a combination of this sequence and the biomarker abnormality prob probabilities, which are actually themselves estimated from the data using mixture modeling. Um, we wouldn't have to use mixture modeling strictly for a genetic disorder, but for idiopathic diseases, you really need to do that because you don't know if your labeled controls might be actually preclinical patients. So you need to be able to swap those labels. So the mixture modeling is important. And we needed to use MCMC to estimate this sequence because it's a combinatorial nightmare otherwise, an infactorial type of problem. Uh, so this paper, 2014 paper that Alex and I wrote together on data from the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. The idiopathic or sporadic Alzheimer's disease contains some more of the details of the maths for the event-based model. 
Also a discussion of some subtleties of the mixture modeling that you might need to consider if you're going to apply this model yourself to idiopathic diseases. And you should also look at Alex's other paper from 2015 uh, for discussion, discussion of the missing data strategy. And that was mentioned in an earlier slide, so you can find it there. Now, the, this basic robust EBM from, from this paper in 2014 has been applied by our group um, and collaborators across multiple neurological disease applications. So we've looked at Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, uh, progressive forms of multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease in Down syndrome, and some unpublished work that's uh, in progress on Parkinson's disease and also creutzfeldt jakob or prion diseases. So let's talk about some results now that you have some intuition for the model. Here's our positional variance diagram. If we just consider the, the frame on the left first. So we have going from top to bottom, early to late biomarkers in the disease progression. And going from left to right, the confidence, the uncertainty. So you can see there's quite a large uncertainty towards the end of the sequence, which means that we're not quite sure of the ordering here. It's somewhat interchangeable. This sort of happened at the same time, the same point in the disease progression. Now the color coding I've used here is to give you an idea of different biomarkers, uh, different classes of biomarkers. So these orange ones are all PIB from Pittsburgh compound B, PIB PET. So these are regional measures of amyloid deposition across the brain. The yellow ones are from cerebrospinal fluid measurements of phosphorylated tau, total tau, and again, amyloid. Gray is regional volumes corresponding mostly to gray matter regions in the brain. Green is the FDG PET estimation of hypometabolism across the cortex, so decreased metabolism of glucose. And the MMSE here is that cognitive test score I mentioned before. So you can see that the disease progression is fairly, fairly strongly ordered early on uh, with amyloid followed by tau, followed by a mixture of neurodegeneration, hypermetabolism and cognitive deficits. And this basically follows uh, what we know about the disease already. Um, but with more detail, more fine grain detail, understanding of the disease progression. On the right here, the right frame, we've got some cross-validation. So you can see the uncertainties increased. The cross-validation was performed using 100 bootstrap samples. So we sampled the same number uh, with, uh, with replacement. So these are the, all, all mutation carriers were included here and it's 211. We did that 100 times, refit the model and uh, calculated again the, the positional variance diagram. And there's also in the supplementary material for the paper, I'm not going to show today, some exploratory event-based models for each mutation group. So each of the three subtype uh, submutation groups um, within this population. But what I will show you is um, some extra models, event-based models for a different, uh, different genetic risk factor in Alzheimer's disease, the polymer protein E, E4, E4, or allele. So for those that are those that mutation carriers in 61, 61, 61 to 211, who were also tested uh, positive to one or two E4 alleles of ApoE, um, the disease progression sequence is not quite the same. So it's the same ordering I've presented here, but you can see that uh, this estimates, this data estimates that CSF amyloid is earlier uh, than in particular CSF tau. So the ApoE4 positive mutation carriers in Diane, in the Diane study, tend to show that amyloid abnormality is definitely the first thing that happens. And that makes sense because this risk factor uh, relates to uh, amyloid generation, excessive generation usually. And for the negative carriers, it looks a little bit more like the original progression pattern with a little bit of variability in these later markers. So the, the good thing about this, when you have a model such as this, you can take a new patient or even the patients that you've used, the, the data participants that you've used to fit the model, and you can line their the individual data up with the model and put them into their most likely stage. And when you do that, what you get is uh, what we found for this data at baseline. So this is all just baseline data. No, no longitudinal data was included in our event-based model so far. All the non-carriers, this black bar, 100% of them were staged at stage zero. None of their biomarkers were at. For the mutation carriers who would be otherwise called cognitively normal, as in have a clinical dementia rating scale score of zero, uh, 
They were spread out among early stages up to about stage 15, with the exception of this individual here, who I'll highlight in a second. And the mildly symptomatic, so with the CDR clinical dementia rating of 0 0.5 mutation carriers were spread from early to late stages as these blue bars. And then the diagnosed, um, essentially diagnosed Alzheimer's disease individuals with a dementia rating score of greater than or equal to one were all staged at stage 16 or later. Now this can be used as a classifier, if you like, a sort of more traditional machine learning classifier. So you can take an event-based model stage, say 16, and see that almost all the patients are above and almost all the controls, so to speak, are below. And that'll give you something like a 99, 98% accuracy because of this individual. But it can do more than just that. This fine-grained picture of disease progression uh, has actually proved very useful for this individual who I'll mention now and then show you a bit more in the next slide. This person had a clinical dementia rating score of zero, but the model based on the biomarker data alone staged them at a very late stage of this disease at stage 20. This individual had 17 out of the 21 biomarkers measuring abnormal. And then two years later, they developed symptoms. It became CDR 0.5. So the event-based model was able to discern this individual who had advanced progression, yet was in a clinically normal appearing asymptomatic state. The model was able to detect them uh, early without uh, the clinical label. And if we look at how they followed up, so if we have on this axis stage at visit one, which was uh, mostly the baseline, uh, so, is, so the model stage progression from top to bottom, uh, and the model stage at the follow-up visit, visit two, left to right. So this individual that was initially staged at stage 20 progressed to stage 21 um, at month 24, two years later. Most of these, so this, this is a, sh a demonstration of consistency, longitudinal consistency of the model. If we look at the later visits um, from individuals, look at their data, line it up to the model and see where they were staged, you can see that most individuals stayed at the same disease stage or progress towards the right to later stages at the follow-up visit. Uh, except for this individual who was initially staged around stage nine and then at visit two, uh, 12 months later, was staged quite early at uh, stage one. Now uh, this individual was a pre one mutation carrier who had discordant uh, in amyloid levels uh, between PET images, so positron emission tomography images, and cerebrospinal fluid measurements. Their PET measurements were normal and CSF were abnormal at the follow-up visit, which pulled them back to stage one as their most likely stage. And this is known to happen, this dis discordance between PET and CSF measures of amyloid deposition in the brain. Uh, you can see references for that in the paper. So if we look at the disease progression staging, the estimation, estimation from our event-based model uh, versus the current state of the art, the estimated years to onset based on when your parents, uh, the parents of mutation carriers showed symptoms. If we stick uh, the event, the estimated years to onset on the vertical axis and the data-driven model stage, event-based model on the right axis, you can see that for CDR zero in green, CDR 0.5 in blue, and CDR one or more in red, we have fairly consistent um, results for the asymptomatic mutation carriers. This is only mutation carrier data. Fairly broad uh, range of disease stages for the data-driven model compared to the um, clinical estimate of disease stage, which is all very close to symptom onset, suggesting high variability bet between individuals. Um, so we could use more follow-up data to test that see which of these individuals um, develop symptoms, which don't. Um, and they could be due to subtypes as well. Perhaps some of these are uh, on a different, slightly different disease progression pattern, which our simple EBM that we implemented in this paper doesn't handle. Uh, and this is basically no correlation. So that's the event-based model results. Now the differential equation model, so just to remind you, the idea of the differential equation model is to estimate long-term trajectories of biomarker data from short-term data that you actually have in the study. I'll give you a cartoon of that in a second. So this, this underlying assumption, the implicit assumption is that everyone's following the one progression pattern and individual snippets, short-term longitudinal data are considered as short samples across this average trajectory. 
Now data was only included from mutation carriers for this because we just want to find disease progression, disease trajectory, uh, and non-carriers are not on a pathological trajectory. So in this cartoon, what we want is on the left, some idealized trajectory with some measured measurements over time. And what we actually have is samples of this in the middle, but we don't know where they are in the disease progression. We actually just have time since baseline. So there's just this mess that we have over here on the right. But if you take the rate of change for each individual, and you can plot the rate of change against the baseline value, and you get this differential equation model curve here, which can be integrated back up into what you wanted. So disease progression now becomes disease time, actually quantified time. There's an analogy with physics here. This is speed plotted against distance. And if you want time, you can get that by dividing distance by speed, which is integrating along this curve. And there are details of the, the differential equation model and the maths inside the paper. So let's talk about some results for dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. We used a univariate approach. So we fit each biomarker independently of each other. And this is in contrast to the event-based model, which uh, puts them all together. So here's an example of a model fit for differential equation modeling. We have the MMSE, the mini mental state exam score, which varies from 30, which is full marks, for this global cognition measure uh, down to zero towards the left, uh, which is severely impaired. So if you plot the, the rate of change for individuals uh, against their baseline value, what you find is quite a lot of the healthy ones, the ones towards the healthier side, actually some of them improved with some learning effects potentially. Um, but as you get lower and lower in the score, you decreased, your, your, your score declined faster. Um, and to, to a point, and then it slows, it slows down again. So this is essentially acceleration from maximum score of 30, and then deceleration uh, again. So the trajectory you get when you integrate this looks, uh, you can, it looks a little bit like this. This is a lot of information in this figure, so I'll go through it in some detail. The black dashed line is the average trajectory. So you can see on the vertical axis, the MMSE score going from 30 uh, over some time, accelerating down and then starting to flatten out again down towards five. Horizontal axis is time. So this is time estimated relative to uh, a data-driven estimate of symptom onset, which you can come up here, see all these all the trajectories pass through this red line, which is the median of this box plot, the red box plot for symptomatic mutation carriers. So this is the data-driven estimate of symptom onset in this, in this cohort. And the green box plot corresponds to asymptomatic mutation carriers. So on the, the dynamic trajectory for this biomarker, green to red is this transition from normal to abnormal. Now all these gray curves in the background are integrated samples from the posterior of our probabilistic fit. So this was, go back to the fit, this was fit with Gaussian process regression. And you can see some more details about that in the paper. So this gives us an explicit probabilistic estimate of, uh, of these trajectories. And then when you look at this transition for each of those samples, it takes a different amount of time. And some of the distribution, you get this blue curve here with the corresponding vertical axis on the right. And I've labeled it the abnormality transition time. So this is a probability density or distribution for um, this transition from normal to abnormal and when it occurs pre-symptomatically. This is some, some idea of how long and how early how slow and how um, early this biomarker starts to transition. This is of clinical interest uh, for fairly obvious reasons. And when you integrate, uh, oh, and this magenta, I should say this magenta plot here overlay is from a cross-sectional results from Bateman et al. that I showed briefly before in an earlier slide. And it's this part based on cross-section analysis. So you can look at the difference. The differences and similarities are discussed within the paper. So if you... Have a look at a few more markers here. We've got some, I've listed them from top to bottom and left to right in roughly in the order in which they, they turn up um, in the sequence. So you can see that earlier markers have quite a long progression from quite early, um, slower, whereas later markers are faster and uh, just before symptom onset. Um, these numbers shown here are the number of mutation carriers with available data changed per modality because some people didn't have PET, some didn't have MRI, some didn't have CSF. All the numbers, all the details are in, uh, in the paper. So when you integrate this 
um, these probability densities for how, how slow and early the trajectory is, you get some sort of cumulative abnormality, which looks like data-driven sigmoids, essentially. Uh, so people in the Alzheimer's disease field will be familiar with sigmoids. So this is sort of a data-driven version of those sigmoids. And I picked a few representative markers, some early, some late, and some moderate ones, uh, labeled here going from am amyloid and tau through cognition volumetric uh, changes and hypermetabolism. And I put time in a log scale so you can separate them out, see them out a little bit more. Okay, so what can we actually do with this model then? You know, what we did in the paper was try to predict symptom onset um, for the, some of these patients who came into the study with no symptoms. Um, we tried to predict on unseen data. So we, had, we, we identified, before we fit the models, we identified six mutation carriers who developed symptoms during the study and left them out of the model fits. Then we staged them all. So in this cartoon, we've got whole brain volume. There's a new measurement of an individual in this magenta dot. You draw the line across to the probabilistic trajectory and project down and you have some estimate of disease time. So this gives you your disease stage and a confidence. And if you weight the average of this disease stage um, by inverse confidence across biomarkers, that gives you your over. Okay, so we can predict symptom onset uh, in unseen data. So before we fit our differential equation models, we identified six mutation carriers who developed symptoms during the study. So they enter the study without symptoms and develop symptoms uh, in 12 or 24 months later. And we, to predict their symptom onset, we had to stage them first. We had to find where they were on the disease timeline and estimate their time to onset. There's a cartoon here of how that's done with an actual trajectory for whole brain gray matter volume. You have a new measurement here, this magenta dot project across, line it up with the trajectory, project down, estimates a time and a confidence. And then you weight those, weight those times by the confidence or the inverse confidence across all biomarkers. This gives you an estimate of disease stage and an estimate, estimated time to symptom onset for that individual. And then when you plot your estimated time to onset, so if we just focus on the orange line here, it could be red in your color scheme, it's called the ETO. This is the model version, the differential equation model estimate of disease stage. Um, you see that we have quite a tight fit. Um, this is plotted against actual years from onset. So there are six individuals here. If I identify these two here, they were, when they entered the study, they were one year from symptom onset. So they were estimated years to onset of minus one. There are three individuals here who were two years before. And there was one individual here who was three years before. Uh, so the red curve, orange curve, is the model-based one from our paper. And the blue and the black fits in confidence intervals and data points are from the clinical estimates, EYO. The blue one is from the parental age of onset and the black one is from the mutation age of onset. So you can take averages across people having the same mutation type. And you can see that from those two clinical estimates, they estimated that this individual was 15 or 20 years before expected onset, when in fact there were only three. And our model managed to pick that up. So clearly we had a small error. So this is uh, on the vertical axis, the error in the estimated years to onset. Um, and then on the horizontal axis, the model-based ETO and the clinical EYO and mutation EYO, which had quite large written in squared errors compared to us. And the further point to take from this is that our model tends to overestimate the um, time to onset, which corresponds to a conservative estimate. Basically, it predicts that symptoms will occur sooner than they actually do. So for a patient in a clinic, you're saying you will probably get symptoms in two years, but then that it turns out they actually get them in three years. And uh, we have anecdotal evidence that patients actually prefer this. They would rather this conservative estimate than be surprised by an earlier onset. So that's another benefit to, to our model. Bear in mind, it's only you know, uh, six data points, but uh, that was all that was available. And we hope to continue this reanalyze re further in the future. So do the same sort of comparison then as uh, we did earlier, the, the model-based version on the vertical axis this time, model-based disease stage, ETO, versus the clinical EYO, uh, with the diagonal line here showing um, agreement. This, this would be hypothetical agreement, this is the equality line. And you can see that the lines are slightly flatter, um, which you know, again reiterates that the EYO tends to underestimate 
uh, when symptom onset will occur. Okay, so across both models, we've got, I remind you again, the left-hand side, the positional variance diagram from the event-based model, showing the sequence of biomarker abnormality from top to bottom, and the uncertainty in that, that sequence from left to right as a grayscale plot. And on the right-hand side, we've got a sort of a top view of those data-driven sigmoids, where the yellow is completely normal, the purple is abnormal, these stars, uh, represent the midpoints of these data-driven sig sigmoids, excuse me, and the white bars represent the um, median absolute deviation of the probability density for the abnormality transition type, basically the width of these sigmoids. So you see a lot of overlap. Um, and the, the summary is that using these two models, we get a quite a full um, picture of the disease progression for dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, both the ordering and the timing of this abnormality sequence. It's quite consistent across models, uh, certainly within the model uncertainty anyway, um, and broadly agrees with our current understanding of the disease progression, dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, which is essentially starts with a low and long and slow accumulation of amyloid and tau, um, followed by fairly rapid neurodegeneration in striatal regions, and then slow and moderately placed cognitive decline and broader neurodegeneration. The benefit of these models, as well as providing more detailed understanding, is the predictive utility, some of which I've described earlier. So there's an extensive discussion in the paper, um, but here's just a few key points. It's, both the models are applicable to idiopathic diseases, so we don't rely on this uh, rare disease, uh, this benefit of this rare disease in having that estimated years to onset available. Um, uh, previous results for this particular disease relied on EYO, so you, you wouldn't have been able to generalize to idiopathic diseases. And then both models assume a monotonic progression, which is sort of sensible for neurodegenerative disorders without uh, in, in disease modifying therapies available. And they're both quite simple, they both assume a single pattern. They, they still work quite nicely, though, despite this simplicity. So, specifically, then for the differential equation model. Um, it requires dynamic markers and it requires low measurement noise, both of which can cause uh, the, the fits to fail, the differential equation model to not work for individual biomarkers. And you can see some of that in examples of that discussion around supplementary figure 14. So future work that we'd like to do um, for the differential equation model is generalized from a univariate model where all the biomarkers are fit independently to a multivariate model. And this might uh, remove some redundant information that may be present, for example, across regional volume volumetric markers in the brain you may only need one or two rather than the whole brain the event-based model um, we found some subtle differences across subgroups but the numbers were getting a little bit small to really you know be sure about to, to make concrete conclusions um, so we'd hope for a little bit more data um, and then we can apply this uh, subtype and stage inference model of, uh, of alex young's which you can read on bioarchive and the good news about the overall pattern, the overall disease signature that we estimated using these data-driven models is that the similarity between dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, these models of dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, and the models that we've estimated of idiopathic Alzheimer's disease is quite promising for drug trials. So if the drugs work in dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease, then they may well work for idiopathic AD, which is uh, very promising news. And none of this would have been possible if it wasn't uh, for the participants in the, in the study and their families. So I'd like to offer them a special thanks. And then thank everyone for, for listening who managed to tune in.